This talk is in two parts. Uh, the first is given by Ian Blair, and then the second will be given by myself. And I Ian Blair's little uh, just is just something about the Penn uh, Centre, Superfund Research Program Centre. And I've got to say, first of all, that it's really an honour to be here and to be invited and to be able to hopefully partner up with you all. You've, you've, there's been such wonderful work done over the years and, and the work of CARD is, CARD is really seminal. So it, it's really humbling to, to be here. We have a centre that we developed in response to issues of an area that has the same sort of problems of CARD but in a much smaller way, which and I'll show some pictures later of it, is a suburb of Pennsylvania. And it became the focus of two uh, fairly large, nothing like Libby, uh, Superfund areas because of asbestos. And as that happened, we developed this research program really through our activities with the community and it became clear that they had a number of questions and we talked to them about what, what they needed that were scientific questions that could be answered by research. And so to address those, we put together this uh, Superfund Research Centre that I'll, I'll very briefly tell you about and for some of the things I could tell you more about if you ask questions. Uh, the first project in this is the mobility and fate of asbestos and it turns out that this is a very important area but there had been really no research done on it since about 1970 and that seems to be true of a lot of things about asbestos. People thought around 1970 we had asbestos solved, caused cancer, uh, we kind of reduced the risk and, and that's all we have to do. And what we're still doing and EPA is still doing, they when they Think about the movement of asbestos as sort of as a little round ball and the movement of things, chemical things, is sort of little round balls and they move along. Asbestos isn't a little round ball, it's a long spiky fibre and there's been no work and this we're particularly doing this in soil, Doug Jerolmack, and it isn't it doesn't move like a round ball, it's a spiky fibre. If the spike is going this way and there's water, it races through things. If the spike is like this, it immediately stops, everything blocks up. It's also the movement is altered as to whether it's a single fibres or, or little fibrils or it aggregates. And it turns out that in soil there's all the, Doug's found, there's, there's these things that will make it aggregate. The pH, and, and there are certain acids, uh, organic acids that are present in some soil that really encourage it moving. And there are others that stop it. Uh, and we haven't got this to changing the way EPA works, but it's clear that the what the, the composition of that cover that's put over things is unknowingly before very important for whether the asbestos is like there forever or it starts shooting through when the conditions uh, change, especially hydration. So that, that is, and there's just fabulous work. We've got little videos and things. It's, it's so interesting and I think so ultimately important. And we're in the, we've, we've got the Superfund in for renewal. And if, if it's renewed, which I hope, uh, we will actually start doing some field testing in the second years and, th and third years and the like. Uh, and we've arranged with the Ambler area, they're very keen on having that field testing done there. So, you know, what's happening? How good is this cover? Is it going to move? Same things people asked yesterday. You know, how sustainable is this? And we would very much like to include Libby also in that. And let, let's see, you know, how effective this remediation is and is there other ways it can be changed. The second project uh, is, which has a mineralogist, Rito Gear, 
and Alana Perez, who's a, a biologist, is looking at bioremediation and plants and asbestos. Uh, plants are very important in two ways. One is what do you put on the top of a remediated area? What sort of things grow? And will they prevent erosion? And certainly in Ambler we had big trees growing in, in the first Superfund area and uh, they were let grow up and they die. It, ha it happens to trees. And when they fall over, all the asbestos that was underneath is unearthed and comes up and this is visible to everybody and is clearly not very, uh, not very satisfactory. So that's one issue. The, the second issue is whether certain uh, bioorganisms can actually uh, inactivate the carcinogenicity of, uh, of the asbestos. And some of it, probably not all, is done by removing iron and living asbestos is the most iron rich of all the forms of asbestos that I'm aware of. I'd have to, Rito is a mineralogist, he may know some others, but it's got a lot more iron so than chrysotile. And is that important in the biologic effects? Is that important in the remediation? The idea is we find or we know some now, uh, and, and little ecosystems that can inactivate the carcinogenicity and, and maybe the immune effects and sit on the surface of these areas that we want to do. So they're, they're the first two uh, projects, bioremediation projects. Uh, we're also looking in, as a new project, the role of estrogens in malignant melanoma mesothelioma because uh, people have noted, and I think it's seen in Libby, that, that women uh, have, uh, are at much increased risk over the occupation things, but then men were the ones who mostly worked with uh, asbestos. We see the same thing in Ambler. The rate of increase of, the mes of mesotheliomas is more in women than in men. And is there a biologic explanation? There are, are there differences in the susceptibility? So we're, with Trevor Penning, who's a renowned biochemist, is, has a, is, is plans to look at that. Uh, we have the studies of, of MELPO, who we just call MELPO, that uh, were referred to with the flaxseed yesterday. And she's also <coughs> looking at other mechanisms of toxicity. And, and it's very uh, important nowadays is that chlorination seems to play a big role in, in toxicity. And, and is, is that involved also in asbestos? And if it is, it gives <coughs> us new things to, to intervene on. Uh, and we have the, the project and I'll just say a little bit about that uh, Ian Blair and Anil Vachani has been out here to Libby and, and is a pulmonary uh, specialist on biomarkers. And, and the biomarkers came up in Ambler just as they did yesterday. You know, who's at risk? Is there a way of knowing we're at risk and uh, early on or do we have to wait till we've got a cancer? Um, which is, you know, not ideal. And so, the uh, particular looking at HMGB1 as a biomarker and, and Libby Amphibol. And the status of that is that uh, Ian started looking at it. Ian is really a, a world renowned biochemist. And, and what he discovered was that actually the what we'd been measuring in the past and the ways we'd done were actually very primitive. And not only that, they were wrong because the uh, HMGB1 is on platelets, most of it, and it was being measured in serum. And, and what you got in serum just depended whether some had come off the platelets or not. And uh, he uh, has, and he has some papers out on this now, it really has to be measured in, in plasma. And the method is, is there are slides on it, and the, 
the real focus now is that there are, are particular parts of the, the, the DNA structure that are responsible for the change in HMGB1. And Ian, I think, has just about got it down to the one active area from five that looked active. So uh, it's still under development, but we really, he has a lot of confidence now how that works, it, it, that site is related a lot to uh, the uh, active oxygen, oxygenization, and that that will really has promise as a biomarker of the inflammation and <coughs> uh, in, in an inflammatory phase in the effects of asbestos. So they're the, they're the main research projects and then the centre also has what are called cores. Uh, there's an administration research translation core. There's a data management and analysis core and, and that has uh, a lot of capabilities, really extraordinary these days in inf informatics, data structure, uh, data management and analysis, graphing and modeling data and artificial intelligence applying to data, looking for patterns and things that we as humans don't see. And that, that I think is of eventual potential use here because you have wonderful data, but you know, what's hidden in there is that we as humans miss when it gets very complex. Uh, we have a community engagement core that I head, and I will talk a bit more about that when I get up and talk and Ian gets, sits down. And, uh, but one of the things we're proposing in that is to have an, what we're calling the NCAAC, the National Asbestos Community Advisory Committee. And NACAC. So, and the idea there is that particularly as we look at this stage of what happens after EPA finishes, uh, a number of communities, uh, Libby, Ambler, are both in the same situation. EPA is about <coughs> to depart. It's all back, the responsibility is back to the site owners and the like. And we want to create a body <coughs> Uh, we'll have Linda Reinson, the asbestos ADAO, on it. Uh, I know Brad and Tracy have already shown interest, and I, and I hope others will from Libby. We've got people from Whitpain Township and, and other places around Ambler. We have, we'll have a process of identifying and bringing on other committees so, so that we can share information about what's happening strategize how to work and, and what needs to be done in, in this phase. It's kind of, kind of been overlooked. People have said, yeah, super fun comes, they fix it up and, and it's all done. And then we have a research experience and training coordination core. So uh, Ian says, are there any questions? <laughs> and, and if not, I'll hand over to my colleague. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. So. <laughs> so, Ian, what would you like to see next? What do you want to, what well, we're hoping we, I suppose we're hoping we get funded, but I think, I think we really, uh, you know, the work in Libby is wonderful, and, and yet, and yet asbestos is such a huge problem. I think we want, two things, thanks for that question. Two things. Uh, uh, first of all, I've worked on a lot, lot of different things and really only at the end of my time, I guess, come to asbestos. I've, I've worked on a lot of different chemicals. I've worked on the effects of sunlight. We proved it causes cataracts. We've done all sort of things. And they're all kind of, you know, science is sort of friendly. Those are a few antagonists and people. But this is different. Asbestos actually is kind of nasty. First of all, it's easily the biggest problem. As a killer, it kills more people than all the rest of the occupational environmental health things that we think of together. And, and, the, and the world, at least in the World Health thinks that, and they've looked at the statistics worldwide. But it's kind of a funny field. It's a lonely field. There hasn't been a lot of research emphasis. We have no other Superfund research programs 
any interest or do anything about uh, asbestos. Arsenic. There are 10 or 12 of them around the country doing arsenic. Lead. Uh, perfluoro acids. There are all these and new centres popping up all the time doing research <coughs> on them. Asbestos. It's just us. And then there's a few other people in the field. It, and yet it's, it's the biggest problem. The second thing that's, that's, is that I've never been in anything else that's had so much, it's not politics, it's vested interests. There are all these vested interests in asbestos. It, I, I've never seen it before with any of these other committees. Of course, you know, there'll always be people on the other side, whatever side you're in, but it, it's, it's really, it's, it's a different field. So we, we gotta, we gotta hang in there and the right is might uh, in, in this one. Uh, so I wanted to talk in, in my part on a little bit about our pilot study on biomarkers of exposure. I've sort of introduced that already. Community engagement, particularly around what happens after EPA remediation ceases. And the memorialization of, of risk. And, uh, and then at the end, we have some new clinical trials and, and the opportunities if they're of interest to, to people in Libby. Uh, the biomarkers is really stimulated by these unique features. The, the, when we think of Libby, the, the aggressive pleural disease, the high prevalence of immunologic effects, how early can we detect who's at risk and who has them? And our, our ultimate objective is that for populations like that at Libby and elsewhere, we, we really ought to be able to de detect things before, before the cancer. Uh, early detection of cancer is better than late detection. There's no doubt about that. But we can't, we're treating at that stage. We're not intervening in the genesis of the thing. So that, that's obviously the rationale. And we have actually conducted a pilot study and before Ian found that actually the serum was not the thing to look at, we were, we'd actually collected serum from living people. So we've gone back and we've looked uh, and particularly at, we've taken plasma and we're just awaiting the final, uh, you know, the final method and, and the actual best target and all. Uh, and, and I can't really explain the biochemistry of this well. And, and actually Ian would not trust me to try to explain it. But uh, it's done using ultra performance liquid chromatography, extremely high resolution mass spectrometry, uh, at Ian's lab. So that's sort of, we've got the specimens there, they're waiting, we're waiting on, on the final thing. So that, that's the first thing. Um, and, and we will look at associations between markers and clinical features. And the, and the great thing about the Libby population is that if we can have some, we can also look longitudinally at things because we are following people longitudinally, not cross section. And we will make comparison with other groups with whom we have plasma, unexposed people with mesothelioma and, and the like. A second issue I want to uh, talk about briefly is community engagement and what we've done at AMBLA. And AMBLA between, AMBLA was really where the manufacture of asbestos started. Uh, a Penn graduate, <laughs> who we kind of may or may not be proud of, discovered in the 1890s, he had a lab accident. He made milk of magnesia and he had some asbestos. I'm not certain why, but he had them and he spilt the milk of magnesia on the asbestos and it dried up on his uh, hot plate and then he discovered this stuff is an am amazingly strong and a wonderful insulator. And out of that started making building materials, pipes, shingles for roofs, insulation, 
things. And by, uh, by 1910 to 1930, this is the biggest manufacturer of asbestos products in the world. Uh, and after it all closed down, mainly because it couldn't meet the legislation in the 1970s, there were huge waste deposits. And what we have are significantly increased rates of mesothelioma in, in around that and not in other areas that are adjacent. Two of those waste areas were made Superfund sites but at different times. The first one, 1984 to 1996, was worked on and covered and that, that's where the trees have fallen over. It's, it's, it's an unsatisfactory job and it's obvious to everyone in the neighbourhood. Now, it looked great when they left, but it's really unsatisfactory. It's eroded, there's all sorts of problems. Uh, they formed then Bow Ridge, and I'll tell you later the story of Bow Ridge, because there's a, that really introduces memorialization. But we've been members of the Bow Ridge CAG. I've been a member since 2007. And that's when we got the idea of, hey, there are, there are things need research in asbestos, and let's put this together. But what we've doing, been doing in the Community Engagement Corps, we've really been trying to understand more the impact on the community and, what the co and, and really basically what is the community, what do people out there think about having Superfund sites? Uh, how do they understand it? How do they, what are their perceptions of risk? What do they think ought to be done? And we've done this by using mixed methods, mainly in-depth interviews, which we record and video, go for about an hour and a half with people. And it's amazing, I knew these people, but I really didn't know what they thought, really, until I read these in-depth interviews. And, and it's, it's amazing how much good. So out of that, we can analyze that data. There's software that takes things and makes like things. And we can, we can really know what's going on. And then we can devise activities. I don't have time to talk to what we've done, but we've done a variety of different things to, to address the sort of underlying concerns and understand what is motivates people and then, and then get them together in dealing with things. And our focus now there is on this post-remediation phase. What happened? It, it's easy when EPA is there. They've got all these resources, they've got a lot of money, and they've got experts on everything. But when they go, it transitions to the owners. In our case, it's less complicated than living. In our case, there are the state governments and the local governments. Because of the nature of Pennsylvania, local governments are very important. It's a commonwealth in, in doing things. So what they wanted, they've got a lot of jurisdiction over what they do. And then there's the site owners, and, and the, we only have three of them, you have a thousands. But they're the people now who are responsible in their places. For, they don't have the resources of EPA, they don't have the knowledge. And when we look at what there's, uh, what's going on here, there's uncertainty, changing goals from the state and, and other people, magnified hazards for vulnerable groups of people who have less resources, it, it, the hazards worse for them. Uh, competing scientific and lay narratives, you know, maybe other people with vested interests sticking the ideas into there, and they're all competing. Concerns about the stigma, uh, communi communication needs, who do we, how do we find it out, who do we believe, what's good. And, and yet, it's this part, and yet, because with asbestos, we're not removing it in most places. We're just covering it. The risk is still there. It's not like the other super fun things where they take it away and put it somewhere else. The risk is still hiding there. And, and if it's going to be sustainable, we've got, got to have to handle that risk for all that period of time. And, you know, both Bo Ritt and, and Lib are entering that phase and, and we want we would like to take advantage of that uh, and, and we would like to do again I think in depth interviews we may do some focus groups that it's complex they have different some different purposes uh, and, and and out of that figure out how to better handle this space and maybe feedback to the government uh, I mean we've done things on, on our initial work feeding back to EPA. They handle communities very badly. And 
the interviewers told us why. And, and you know, we can help them work better. Help ensure what the, the vulnerable, the voices are heard, because they're not heard otherwise, unless you have a systematic process to hear them. Um, and and what, what information do people need? And, and into that we can put things like the migration of asbestos, vegetation use selection, there's a lot more things, risk reduction and a system in, in the process. So we would like to do, to put in, and I can talk later about how we do it, we identify key people, we have people like real estate agents because they, they address, you know, selling the area. Uh, all sort of things and we use what's called snowballing. We ask people who else have ideas we are, is important <coughs> in this community have areas we'd like to. So that's, that's that uh, activity. And I wanted to say something specifically about this business of memorialization. <coughs> you, know, you know, we have, as humans, and, and it's historic, they had them in, wow, Greek and Roman times and things. We have memorials. We have war memorials, we have holocaust memorials. We, we have things that, and they're there to remind people about conflicts, about horrors, violence, things that don't want to happen again, so that we're not repeating the, the, the problems uh, of history. And, and this, I think, how you do this is a process. Well, let me tell you a little bit about uh, well, and I said, you know, asbestos particularly because the hazard is still there. Uh, and let me give you the example from what I call the short-term memory loss. Short-term memory loss. <coughs> because this was Ambler in the heydays of, uh, of the construction. And you can see factories and you can see the waste piles waste piles all around. Uh, these were up to 92 feet high, went down 42 feet into the ground, covered collectively about 67 acres. And, uh, and nobody just wants that. When we did our interviews, no one in the community just wants that fenced off with signs around. And we explored whether that was working we, and we did that by going to YouTube. And on YouTube, I don't have me, on YouTube is like for the teenagers, how to get into the area, how to cut the fence and put, put it back like it, they, you couldn't see it was done. There was YouTubes of the paintball fights against the background of asbestos. It's terrific, you know, the red colour really shows up against the white and uh, so the, uh, anyway, these are uh, the things. So EPA, this was the Ambler site over here, about 20 odd acres of waste in the end. And this is the Bow Ritt site, which they didn't do it in 1996, they did later. So on the, they just finished the Ambler site, 1996. It's all done. EPA's been there, hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars, many dollars anyway, spent fixing it up. 2005, oh, oh here, here's people living, family photograph people living by the asbestos, 1960s. Uh, all dressed up in the Sunday best, it's Sunday they're going to go to church and here they are. That's how the community was. And you've got you know, similar things in living. Maybe worse. Well, they remediated the site and less than 10 years later comes the building proposal. A developer has seen this land over at Bowrit and has decided to have a 17 storey building on the middle of it. It was very unpopular because there's no other building higher than five storeys in the whole area. But so the citizens are fighting this. And then one day a very uh, clever citizen discovers this was asbestos. And asbestos is used as a tool to stop the development. But then people started to think, well, but you know, this asbestos isn't good and these piles and you saw them there and it, uh, all that. 
And that then led to us having the bow rift. So this is only nine years after, just across the road, EPA spent all this time figuring on the thing. But the memory had been totally forgotten. People didn't want to talk about it, uh, get out of there, didn't want the real estate values. And here it is. So then, then the, uh, after, as EPA completes its work, uh, one of the company got the artist's concept. They said, we've got to have a memorial to the asbestos here. And, and an artist came along. I didn't go there. I don't know if the problem was the concept or the artist. <coughs> but everybody hated the idea of that artist doing this memorial. <laughs> and it, it made us think, it's a very important thing, but you've got to do it in a way that it's acceptable to the community. So how do we find that? How do we, how do we, uh, oh, that's the one thing. Oh, this is what it looks like now, remediated. See, it looks kind of nice. Well, sorry, this is two sides. Here's what it looked like with the asbestos rolling of pipes and things. Here's what it looks like right now. So it's from me. You wouldn't know anything come to the area. It's a nice area. You don't know the asbestos lurking underneath. So how do we... And, and so the problem is learning from the past without stigmatising the people. And, and, and the Libby people yesterday raised that same issue. So it needs a process, we believe, to con identify, constructively reconcile different concerns and points of view. And, and we've learned a bit how to do that to Ambler, but we have to all learn it a lot more, uh, amongst community members, and then come out with something that's owned and serves the purpose. And what we would like to do is collect uh, information from interviews, uh, uh, other things, at both Libby and Barrett, because we think there's a lot, there's a lot to, we, we've got to learn how to do this for environmental things. And we want to also by looking at a couple of communities, uh, and, and these are the ones that stand out to yeah. us. You know, what's common to all the communities? What's distinct? How, how do we do this in a way that's best? Uh, and then we would collect data and present them in, in whatever way you think is best to the community and, and I, think, I think we can really help sort of how we do this and bring the, the person I work with in this, Fran Varg, is a wonderful anthropologist and they really have techniques of, of knowing how to do some of these things, although we're learning in this field and, and that's what we'd like to do. And uh, you know, the ultimate success is not a temporary satisfactory cleanup. Like, uh, as we heard yesterday, it's, it's like sustained things that your, your generation and the next generations uh, don't have to live through this history again. Uh, so that's, that's that. So the, the last thing I just want to say is that uh, we actually are starting at Penn three new clinical trials for mesothelioma and uh, there are three of these. I, I won't actually go through the detail of them. But the, we, would, if we would facilitate, I've, I've talked with our, the cancer people and all, and if it was appropriate and, and, and the like, uh, we would facilitate the, the uh, Libby people being able to be in those trials. And that would include uh, assistance with travel, to Philadelphia. Some of the trials are in other centres like San Francisco, other places. Travel to those centres and uh, doing them. And they're mostly for people who failed the first uh, level of, of, uh, of treatment at this stage. But there, there are certainly people in, in those categories. And so we would like to, uh, you know, make that, make that available uh, to Libya. And generally, I know we we really want to. I mean, you've done such great stuff. It would be an honour to be able to work with you. Thanks. <laughs>